Welcome uh, you all to the Guest and Gasto. It's SCAT's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators remaking culture. I'm Professor Jens Koemle, the chair of the fashion department, and I'm happy to introduce Jonathan Cohen and Sarah Leff. Jonathan and Sarah are the power duo behind Dr. Jill Biden's striking purple ensemble and mask worn on the eve of the inauguration. The look is from the yet to release Jonathan Cohen Fall 2021 collection. So Jonathan's Mexican American identity strongly influences his work both on a thematic and a production level. Both he and Sarah, the company's CEO, are keen on sustainability, frequently utilizing unused fabric scraps available through their accessories and lifestyle line, The Studio. Today, they are going to share how they built their brand and continue to successfully collaborate during the quarantine. There is here now the Instagram link, so we're gonna post that, you can see it, and it's at Jonathan Cohen Studio, again on Instagram. Then in order to start the whole uh, Guest and Gusto session, there is a poll question. And the today's poll question is, uh, what VIP that Jonathan has stressed would you like to hear more about? Yeah, so you see now on your screen, the quick poll popping up. So please click onto uh, what you would like to hear more about. Then at the end, we will come to which uh, person on the list did get the most votes and we will also declare the winner to the quick poll. Then please uh, wait with your questions. We will come to the questions at the end of the session. And yeah, we will start. Can we start, Alex, or shall we wait a second with the poll? Are we allowed to vote? Can Sarah and I vote? I already <laughs> voted. Then I guess we start. Welcome you two. It's really a pleasure to have you here. And it's also very great to see the two people behind because mostly in design companies, it is that you see the designer, but that there's also uh, a partner that is involved and is the very important pillar in the business is very often not mentioned. And so I'm very happy to have you both here. And I also fully realize what you have done, what you have created. Shall we maybe start? I always love to hear a bit, how did you get to fashion? So before you even got into university or high school and so forth, there's usually some stories in the background, how in the family or you've seen an exhibition or certain films, what was your first like kick where you clicked that you have an affinity to the fashion world and that you actually want to pursue a career in it? <laughs> I think for me, I've, I've always said the first moment I knew I wanted to be in fashion is actually when I saw, I think I was like five or six when I saw Madonna in the cone bra and John Paul Gaultier's cone bra on MTV. And it just like, I just thought it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. And, you know, as I've gotten older, the more I've thought about that moment, why it impacted me so much. It's because, you know, you saw this piece of clothing that just became this iconic image that just explains so much about that era and that and the culture at the time and the controversy it caused. Um, so for me, that was very much the first like fashion moment that really impacted me where I really kind of felt like that was something I wanted to be a part of. Um, and then, you know, I was very into like Japanese animation growing up and I was always focusing on the costumes of the characters. And, you know, it was one of those things I didn't realize at the time. And then as I got older, it started clicking. I'm like, oh, I should like, you know, I thought maybe I want to be a singer, maybe I want to be a songwriter before I was like, I'm not good at that. And then it finally clicked. I was like, oh, I want to be dressing them. <laughs> so that's that's kind of like the, the short story of it. So Sarah, what did bring you in the wonderful world? I was always very into art and creating things and accessorizing, dressing myself was always a very fun part. When I was in elementary school, we had a school uniform and there was always an accessory or a shoe that was important. Um, I think just as I kind of got older, understanding the business behind it, that it was, I loved getting dressed every day, but there was a whole industry that I could learn about and be part of. Very good, very good. And then of course, both of you are not from New York. So you packed your bags and decided to go to New York. And that's actually where you met. So how, how did this, we all are 
used to you know going to university it starts at the beginning it's a new world you leave home it's usually the first time that you have everything at your disposal you know that you can really explore and so forth so when came that moment between the education that you changed into this entrepreneurial undertaking or how did you do this progressive moment Jonathan and I kind of connected immediately. And I think one thing that we were both very headstrong was, was interning from day one of when we both attended Parsons. Um, we really connected over the stories and the experiences we were learning on a daily basis. So, you know, especially like our first summer in New York, we would hear about everything we did that day of event. Like I had to make six trips to the post office under a PR internship or Jonathan, you know, got to deliver a dress to somebody. And talking through it all and supporting one another, both in school and in our internship experiences, really developed the relationship, but also what we loved about the industry. Jonathan, yeah. how, did yeah. it, Sorry. You, how did it come to the moment that you put your name on top of a, a business? So when Sarah and I met, we were both freshmen in college and we met uh, through a friend and just like she said, through our friendship, we always said we wanted to start a company together. And then after we graduated, we had been working for designers. But it was also like a very bad economic time. And looking, just going into the stores, we felt like there was this lack of print and color and kind of inspiration in the clothing. So we wanted to really, we thought it was a great idea to like pursue it. And we always said we'd start a company, but we didn't realize how quickly we would after we graduated. Um, but we kind of just, we made a list of 20 people we really admired in the industry. We sent them my senior thesis, like we rephotographed it, sent it to them, and we immediately got response. And so we're like, oh yeah, we should like do this. And we left our jobs and <laughs> uh, we started the company and then it was a whirlwind since then. Yeah. Excellent. When did you get into the sustainability elements of your collection. Of course, there's one part that is the floral side of it, but how did you, you know, develop that? Or was that always part of it from the beginning or um, into the... Yeah, it was definitely always a part of it because it, but we didn't even really know that it was called sustainability or, you know, we were just mindful and responsible and, you know, we cared about who was making our clothes and, um, and we really didn't like the direction that fashion was going for this like mass market five, like 20 seasons in one year. We really wanted to slow down the process because we just felt it was just so much waste was being created. And then because we started the company out of um, our apartments, we always said we were like living in the waste of it. So, you know, we'd wake up and there's papers everywhere and the fabric rolls are everywhere. And so you really got to see like how much waste we were creating. So that was something we really wanted to tackle, um, you know, but still make beautiful clothing, still inspired and do what we wanted to do, but in a responsible way. So over the years, we kind of started to tackle that and really um, make that a one of the priorities in our business. We also always chose to work locally just so we could have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with everyone working on our clothes. And the same thing with our fabrics and the mills. Jonathan develops every textile, but we really forged with a relationship with everyone, knowing who was working, who was, who was printing the fabrics, how it was being made. And around 2018, we started doing a case study on our overall consumption and where we were losing fabrics. And we realized cutting our most popular dress, we were throwing out over $27,000 worth of fabric just because of the overall consumption when you go into grading it and markers. And you know, after the factory finishes cutting each style, they might just dispose of the fabric. It might, you know, they are throwing out scraps, but also running yardage. And so we started implementing an entire system into our business that everything that was cut in our fabric, the fabric was left. And it could be everything from a very small remnants to four yard blocks of fabric. And we've been able to really forge ahead and figure out how to make that both a profitable and sustainable component of the business intertwining with new items. Yeah, and you'll see the coat in the slide. That's all created from past season remnants that um, we collect from the studio and also from the factories. After they cut the production, we collect all the remnants and then we put in a bag and we mix up with it. So this is all felted um, remnants from past seasons. Oh, brilliant. 
coming into the past season, there's at the moment a lot to talk about circular fashion, you know, non-seasonal items so that they are available longer than just the general six months on the shop floor that they, yeah, never out of stock or the iconic piece. So do you have those iconic pieces as well that you kind of always offer that you keep or are you on a collection cycle of six months? Um, it's a little mix of both. Like we always have our core pieces that we refabricate or we redo, and then we do add new pieces. Cause for us, it's not about just like, you know, we like creating new products and new shapes and it's important for the creative, um, creative person in me. Um, but we also are really mindful of the waste we create. So it's like a mixture of both. And that's why, like we, we show them both on the run because to us, it's just like, it's a continuous story or when, you know, when runways were like happening. Um, but yeah, so for us, it's kind of a mixture of like continuing certain styles and then um, bringing in some new new ideas and fresh concepts. We also have figured out with our production cycle that while we might put one new of the season fabric into work, we use leftover fabrics or running yardage we have under the tables to create limited edition pieces. So one of our best dresses, which is a fluted sleeve dress, every season is in the collection in a new fabrication. And we're able to do recuts, adding one dress of each fabric or doing smaller runs in that without messing up the traditional cycle, but also starting to eliminate our waste. Yeah, and we also never really succumbed to doing like a resort collection or pre-fall collection. That was something that we were really headstrong about. And a lot of people wanted to push us to do that. And we just kind of stood our ground and just felt that, you know, two collections is good a year. You know, and that that should be enough. And, you know, you see how overwhelmed the client was getting. Your your something's coming into the store and then she's already being told to like purchase stuff for the next season. And, you know, she's overwhelmed and she's confused. And um, there's just so much product that, you know, we saw we did well because our stuff was in the stores and then it would leave, you know, it would sell, it would leave. And then you'd have a little break. And then so when you got it, you were excited and it wasn't like constantly inundating our customer with new product. I think that's a very important message for all the uh, new entrepreneurs or students joining the, the professional world that you actually can stand your ground and you can change the system. So you don't have to follow the madness of the crazy fashion worlds that basically every month's new product needs to be thrown out and then nobody buys it because they're all overwhelmed. So I think it's very important what you've done to disrupt the system and actually create a reality that suits you and allows you to grow and to really say, okay, here we are between, you know, a circular approach, sustainability. We want to make our business, you know, profitable. And it's very interesting to hear from Sarah as well that you actually save money by doing so So great with your you know build up and the structure of your business now before you got to that structure of course you also needed friends and help so how was that at the beginning with competitions or cfda or god knows how did you you know get into all that what happened all there this is a very interesting story as well um it was very organic and you know we were very we've always been very slow and steady and you know really work you know this isn't an overnight situation we really worked hard to like get in the stores that we were at and build those relationships i mean we weren't like our collections weren't on vogue runway until maybe six years into the business you know which i think a lot of people just think that happens overnight it's like no we waited and it took time and then you know, we built those relationships and then finally were able to achieve all those things. You know, we didn't do shows. We didn't, we really stayed out of that for years until we felt our business could really handle it. And so, um, and then I, I don't know, Sarah, do you want to talk more about going into the fashion fund? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so to start with, we built our business with the mentality of selling our clothes, not having a, not solely putting it out for a press purpose. So when we launched the business, we put all of our focus into our distribution, really identifying our customers and getting the feedback. And that helped us grow on a global scale over the years. Um, so in 2018, we were part of the Vogue Fashion Fund, which was phenomenal. We ended up, we were runners up. Um, and it was a phenomenal experience. I think it just allows you to be with 
your peers and conversations. And I don't think it's as much of a competition. I think like we all now two years out of the fund still support one another. If it means wearing each other's brands, knowing other opportunities that we can share with one another, factories, um, talking about stores who's supported and who is not, but it's really allowed us all a, a sounding board. Yeah. And even, you know, our first press piece came about because of uh, someone I went to college with, um, like new an editor and she showed our stuff to the editor. So it's like the person sitting next to you in class or on Zoom, I guess at this point, you know, all of a sudden becomes someone who really can champion you and you can help each other. And I think that was really important for us, you know? So it's like, you, you really, you just never know who all of a sudden is gonna be super instrumental in your life and in your career. So be kind to one another. <laughs> Yeah, it's always like this is in the fashion circle is fairly small and we always meet each other again. So, yeah, definitely. Always. Kind to each other. Here we go now to networking and so forth. Uh, when you started, of course, you mentioned friends, but there were, of course, VIPs coming in as well. You know, there's certain singers, dancers, politicians and so forth. But before we get really to the big event in the inauguration, uh, how was it at the beginning? As you said, you had friends or which one were the first VIPs you actually dressed or came or got into, you know, being supported? So, yeah, also a very good story because it, it came through a friend we went to college with. Um, and that was Lupita. I, we didn't, so the, our friend Michaela, who was styling her, who we were really close in um, college with, had just started working with her and nobody knew who she was. Her movie hadn't come out. And I guess we're like, we're going over the the poll, but it's okay because <laughs> she was Lupita was our our first um, big celebrity that that wore us. And you know, Michaela came to us and was like, "I'm dressing this new girl. Would you be interested in dressing her?" And we saw a photo of her. We're like, "Yeah, she's super cute. Like, we'd love to. Like, what is she doing? Like, is she doing a movie? Like, is she a socialite? Like, who is she?" And she kind of gave us her backstory, and her story was just so incredible that we're like, yeah, of course, we'll like lend clothes to her. And then I think a month later, her movie came out and Sarah and I went to, we're like, we should go look at it. And we left being like, I think she's gonna win an Oscar. I think this girl's going places. It was <laughs> only us and Mucha Prada who addressed her at that point. Yeah. And then she just wore us the night, I think after the Golden Globes. And it, it just was a really, it was a really incredible moment, not just because she's a celebrity, but everything she stood for, but also it was her first movie. Michaela was a new stylist. We were new designers. So that idea of like all these new artists kind of coming together to like support one another and create a moment um, was really, it's irreplaceable. You know, it's something we'll never experience again. Well, I'm sure you're going to have a lot more VIPs coming, but yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the first, that like, you know, like, <laughs> the the stylist being a new stylist, us being a new designer, and then her being her first movie. That was kind of like, that will never happen again, you know, in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> always the first is always like the best. Yeah, exactly. Now, of course, you mentioned already, you're very, you know, evolving your company, always looking out to, you know, change and improve and make the fashion world a better place. What happened you know, you had brick and mortar boutique shops outlets, then you had, of course, direct to consumer through the internet e-commerce platforms. When the pandemic hit, that was a shock for all of us. So how was that for you? And how did you deal with it? Or what was there your good story, bad stories? We really pivoted quickly. Um, we were in Paris when everything started spreading and came back and we saw immediately how it was affecting market and what you're projecting six to nine months for your business. And we had just, it was a year ago yesterday that we did our last runway show last February and we were, we love the collection and we are so excited for it. Um, we decided not to put it into production just because you could not forecast what was going to happen in the next six months between the mills in Italy, the factories in New York and your retailers. So we put all production on hold and decided to really focus on things that we already had, like all of the fabrics under the table, all of our fabric remnants and what we could do with that. And since our studio, like the studio, which is our direct to consumer e-commerce platform that worked with all of our upcycling projects had launched only a few months prior. Um, we were in a position that we couldn't actually ship any of the clothes in March 
when you know FedEx was prioritizing things. So what we decided to in April is launch something called Our Flower Shop. And it was a digital platform with seven digital arrangements ranging between 25 and I think at that point, $35. Um, we offered this that Jonathan spent his time really, you know, looking, he was in California, illustrating the flowers he saw and creating these arrangements and a consumer could go on our site, custom, pick the flower arrangement or order a customized arrangement and send a message. And while doing that, also a donation was made back to an organization. Um, these messages became very powerful over like the three months while everyone couldn't really ship things, didn't feel comfortable receiving items. And we, what we would do is the order would come in, we would customize it, and then Jonathan would have to handwrite each message, um, and then send no it back to the purchaser. <laughs> and we really required that we ask them all to send it to their loved one themselves and really use it as a point to carry on the conversation and or start a conversation. Um, and the flower shop continued to morph, so. Um, we would then were able to do partnerships as it grew. It constantly is getting new arrangements still to this day. We just launched a new one last week. Um, and it carried on new conversations and new organizations that we wanted to help and contribute to, but really couldn't out of our pocket to that same scale. Um, the flower shop now has a flip-flop collaboration with, which is again, sustainable and eco-friendly. We have launched um, stationary and it, it's gonna keep morphing over the years, but it's really been, it was a lifeline for us early on in COVID and allowed us to really have the flexibility to step back and rethink our business. Yeah, it was, it was a really, you know, through this like trying time um, really helped us emotionally, but, you know, and also financially and also be able to help other people that we wanted to help. And I think for me, when um, George Floyd happened, we kind of did, we not kind of we did a bouquet. The hundred of the percent of the proceeds went to the bailout project. It was incredible because we were able to, you know, help and give money, but then also see these incredible messages that people were sending back and forth to each other. Which is why it was really important that it was called our flower shop because we want it to feel like a place of community, even though it's on the internet you know, and that people really felt like they were a part of it. But it was really incredible to see like a daughter send a message to her mother and be like, I'm so happy we like can have these open conversations about race and, you know, um, really break down that that wall. So for us, that was a, a, like, we didn't expect that and we didn't know that would happen. We were just kind of trying to react and using our platform in a way to help. Um, so I remember when I, when I would open some of the messages, I'd just like start crying because it was just one, it was like a really emotional time and still is. And then, you know, to see that was really, it was really beautiful to see that. You also got these, just, you had this new platform to have a relationship with your clients. And a lot of clients were new who were discovering us via press or Instagram or whatever the conversation was. Um, and just sometimes they even got on the phone with us to talk about these arrangements and how they wanted or what the purpose was. And you went from someone buying your clothes and uh, understanding what kind of emotions those evoked. But now, you know, a huge range of people at that price point were able to buy into it and use it as a point of passion and excitement. This is a very interesting story. So it's basically with the pandemic, you already had content. We spoke about, you know, your dedication to sustainability, circular fashion and all that. But now it's even, you know, through the pandemic, you extended the message you have, you know, the compassion that is there, the support to the community that you do give. And I think how, you know, this evolved to collaborations. Is there more collaborations in there? Is there more to come in yes. this, you know, yeah. content building situation? So you're not just doing clothes? Yeah, I mean, um, our flower shop is something and the studio is something that's just synonymous with our brand now. It's not going anywhere. We only plan on expanding it and creating um, more opportunities with it. So it's not something that's just gonna, you know, and once, if this pandemic is over, what, you know, whatever the future holds, it's, it's always going to be there for us. And it's something that we're very passionate about. Um, yeah. We also launched the studio as an opportunity to overwrite the traditional calendar system. You know, we were always in such, so pigeonholed in the traditional conversation of how you should sell your clothes, what the timeline is. And the studio allowed us to break those barriers. 
Um, you know, sometimes you do collaborations and they don't fit into a traditional wholesale fashion calendar. Sometimes they can be turned around in two weeks. Sometimes they need nine to 18 months to develop something. Um, so it's allowed us to constantly not say no to things, opportunities that come to us because we don't have to drop it on anyone's calendar except for ours. And sometimes we're able to find fabric remnants and react in like less than six days and create a new project or we'll find an artist or a vendor or someone that we're inspired by and we can jump right in with the products and explore and test things out. Sometimes they're one off, sometimes we can mass produce it. Yeah, so these were the title flip-flops that um, we launched in our flower shop um, that proceeds went um, back to Grayson Bakery. Um, and they're great because they're made in New Rochelle, right, Sarah? In New yes. York? And um, they're made from castor oil beans, so super sustainable. And um, they're not created from sheets. They're created from molds, so they really um, help with the, the waste of production because it's just creating each flip flop versus like, you know, creating a sheet and then cutting out the shape. Um, and also something that's really cool about them that I did not know is that they have a mold for the left and the right side of the strap, which I didn't realize that a lot of flip flops don't. So if you ever wonder why they're so uncomfortable, that's why. <laughs> But also, it, the organization yeah. works with all veterans who have returned from and have no, are no longer in service, and it gives them a new skill level and job opportunities. So it really sounds that the pandemic for you was a very positive event, is that, you know, all in all, it, it helped to streamline at the same time to innovate and to... Yeah, I mean, positive in the sense that, you know, we were able to, like, pause and recalibrate and create new things in our business. Obviously, I we would have liked to do that without a pandemic, <laughs> you know, and it, it's been very, you know, it, it's just horrible what's been happening. Um, and also just the year we've had in general, aside from the pandemic. Um, so, but yeah, it's in a bit from a business standpoint, we really were proud that we were able to, um, and fortunate that we were able to like make it work. And we've really stepped back and evaluated what did work and what did not work well within our business and trying to eliminate those things that weren't working. Um, we've re-envisioned how we're going into market, how we're doing our wholesale business and how we're also carrying through our direct to consumer business. And we're actually, we're in market starting this week. So we're jumping into the next seasons and really going about it differently. Wow, excellent. That brings me now, of course, to the big question. How did the first lady happen? What was all involved in this story? Um, so that's pretty, oh, and this is, uh, that was the studio pieces that we've done during the pandemic. Um, so you can see we were able to react doing masks and we did like felted pillows and these scarves that were made out of passies and remnants that we just knitted together. Um, yeah. So first lady, uh, <laughs> obviously very amazing. <laughs> so we had done, we had worked with Vogue and um, Dr. Biden's team to create a vote shirt over the summer that raised money for the campaign. And it was really wonderful. Um, and her team like was really great to work with. And um, we had been speaking with them. They asked if we were working on anything and we showed them, you know, part of the new collection that we are working on. And we had this wrap coat um, and it thankfully worked. I <laughs> think like it, it, it was just kind of very, um, I don't know the word, like it was just very, it was a lot of, yeah, serendipitous. Um, and we were shocked when we saw her on TV wearing it and we were so emotional and still, I, I still am having trouble articulate, you know, what it meant for us. But for me, what was so incredible is, um, you know, I felt, and I'm sure a lot of people felt from the last four years, super oppressed and super scared. And, you know, ending with that um, terrorist attack on January 6th was just so scary. And what was so amazing about this moment is that it only happened because the Biden team prevailed and won, you know? And I think that was something that really meant a lot to me personally that, you know, like they did it, they're there. You know, they're going to get inaugurated and um, that moment would have happened if, if they didn't win. And I thought that was what was so incredible about it. 
Yeah, I guess there was for sure a bit of like sweating going on. You know, what is going to happen? Is the code going to make it? Is it not going to make it? There is um, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. You know, you just kinda, and were you, listen, you're used to years of disappointment too. <laughs> you know, the things that like, you know, don't work and you send it and it's just kind of how it goes. And then you just kind of have to hope and cross your fingers that, that it worked. Um, and we were very fortunate that this time it did. Then of course, give us a little bit of the gossip. So how was that? How many bodyguards did come? And how was the general situation with fitting? So I'm very curious about that. Well, I, you know, obviously the, there's COVID going on, so there's no in-person person fitting. fittings. You know, you just kind of, you drop it off and then just kind of get the notes back and then alter it. But luckily- We did see the Secret Service caravan. Yeah, yeah, we did see that. It was 11 cars. Yeah. All right. I was kind of excited. But yeah, we just like, you know, it's it's a different time. You know, it's not like before we were just walk into fit, walk into fitting, especially with, you know, people who are running the country. <laughs> but, of, but of course, this is very important, VIP dressing. So I go a bit further there. Was there a brief given? Was there just like, you know, with the color choice? How did this dialogue, the conversation really go? Because this is a very important piece, you know, the inauguration yeah. piece. It will be a historic stepping stone reference for fashion designers to look back. So how did that happen? How was the discussion about color or the fit? You know, this is like a very delicate subject. So in the color we were kind of already working on, you know, we didn't know what they, what they had planned. You know, we didn't know that that was going to be such a predominant color throughout the inauguration. I honestly thought that it was going to be all white or something, you know, but I had been thinking a lot about purple and we had been discussing a lot about purple because it was the hundred year anniversary of the suffragettes. And so we were researching a lot about the colors they used to wear. So it was always in my mind and I've always loved the color purple, you know, and then it just kind of fit. It was very, like Sarah said, serendipitous. It just kind of fit into what they were looking for, um, you know, and we had done these wrap blazers and coats before, but we were working on a more tailored version of it. Um, but, you know, when they pulled this, you know, we felt confident because I really felt like I could see her in it. You know, I could really see Dr. Biden in it. And it wasn't, it didn't feel so um, like out of left field for her. And I, in general, when I design, especially over the last years, I, I very much, you know, I think it used to be very much like this, because I'm a man, the design for women and a gay man, you know, it's it, it very much is like this gay man idealization of what a woman should look like. And I've really changed that narrative in my head to really be like it, I have to be able to see really picture her in it and not what I idealize her to look like but this really has to be that person if that makes sense um, and I, I think that's because I have so many incredible women around me, you know like Sarah that you know will be in fittings and she's like that's not going to work like over over this area of a woman's body and like I think it's it's very important as a man designing for women um to really respect that and really listen to women how many designs did you do is there the famous design drawing that we all can auction off or you will auction off at some point <laughs> does that exist is there this famous that is the drawing moment well yeah i mean i i sketch so much per collection and that was like one of the first things that we actually from a sustainability standpoint changed were I used to maybe waste I used 5, to waste five thousand sheets. Yeah, per per collection, and I moved all my sketches to the iPad. You know, so all my sketches are there. So yeah, maybe I have to keep that close. But yeah, the, the, all those sketches and iterations of things are on on my iPad now. Yeah, it is definitely that sketch. Keep it somewhere well and safe. Yeah, yeah the yes. <laughs> history will have access to it at some point. No, it's beautiful, really. We do a, we're do super amazed and super at awe with everything you created. And of course, it was for us a very special, I have to say, it moment. We also had our Christopher John Rogers, you know, for. Yeah. Uh, and that, yeah. And that's what was so amazing. Was, uh, about the, yeah. I mean, for us, you know, we were in the fashion fund with Kirby. And so the night that Dr. Biden wore this, um, the VP Kamala Harris wore. Uh, uh, 
Pierre Moss. And so for us, that was just a really incredible moment because we were friends with Kirby and we loved Kirby and we were in the fashion fund together and, you know, he won and we were runners up. So, you know, we're, we're stuck now forever. <laughs> I, I texted him that night. So, but seeing Christopher and uh, Mark Carrion, and then I didn't know who Sergio was. So to be introduced to new designers, I'm like, this is incredible. And what a great um, moment that the administration took to really make that a point, you know? So I, I think that that made it even more special to see all these designers that we know and these new designers that we didn't know kind of have a spotlight on them. So do you have any secret VIPs coming up? Because after this statement, I'm sure there's a few people knocking at the door. So is there anything you can tell us? Is there something we should look forward to? I guess you just have to, we have to see and wait. <laughs> you know, we need to be, it's good to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Now coming back a bit to the reality, how, you know, you also work with students, what would be your advice, you know, to really say for now the seniors leaving in this situation where we are hopefully with the vaccination come back to a new reality, I'm sure the old reality is gone and we come to a new reality, but what would your advice be, what is there something you could really, yeah, that you would like to share? I mean, it's... Sarah, do you actually want to start with this one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting because obviously we do work with SCAD students and I think it's been unbelievable to watch the transition that we're not in real life and we're so used to the tangibility of everything and now everything is digital and it's being, I'm blown away by being able to see someone's true vision, how they translated it onto paper into a PDF for us to review and I think that like portfolios. We were talking about this before the call, like tell your story and be true to who you are, but also put everything out there and not be afraid. Yeah. And I think they're getting a great crash course on how to adapt. And that's something that like you don't necessarily get or what we didn't get when I was in college. So like I really respect all the students that we've been um, been able to talk to and just see how they're adapting to this. And it's really inspiring to see them like still very creative and feeling inspired and um, kind of meeting the moment. So I think that's been really encouraging to see. But yeah, I think your portfolio is going to be very important because you don't have that in-person um, meeting anymore. So it's really going to be about the presentation of your portfolio and showing how versatile you are and showing that I think something that and that we've been talking with the students that we've been working with about about the portfolios, it's very important to show who you are in the portfolio, but it's also very important to show that you can adapt to that company's vision. Cause that's really as not sad, but um, kind of a shock that uh, that may sound like you are gonna be working for another company and, and kind of pushing their vision forward. So it's like, you know, I remember when I was in college, I kind of heard this from someone I, and I didn't really get it at the time, but they're like, you know, you can't go into Alexander Wang and be like, you should be using all color and prints. And, you know, when it's a very black, white, you know, and um, that's that's his vibe and that's what he does well with. So it's like, you know, you really want to go into these companies showing that you can enhance and really um, assist in what they're doing and not go in there with an ego being like, I'm going to come here to change it. That is that Jonathan, you are so right, I absolutely support that. And I'm very happy you mentioned that because the big step for all the students is to understand from the big I like going to understand that they're part of a bigger world, a big fashion world. And that also the segmentation in there from athletic wear to lifestyle to denim to whatever you get into has a certain language and an aesthetic understanding. So yeah, yeah we definitely hope to train them there. Yeah, and, and, of we, and it, it should be a good thing. Like I enjoyed working for other designers and kind of flexing that muscle and, you know, learning how to execute and you learn a lot from it. You know, it's not just about your own vision all the time. So, um, and then when you have your own company, you know, it, it's different, but um, I think it's really important to experience that. And of course, we also, you are part of our SCAT family, because as you mentioned, you are a style of mentor. So you also have the certain students and you are, yeah, we're very fond of your help and support. So thank you for all of that. We really do appreciate that. Yeah, and, great. 
And uh, yeah, I would like to open up to some questions now. Is there or is there anything, Jonathan, you would still like to add to something at this point? Or shall we welcome questions? Because there's quite a few that came Yeah, in. let's do the questions. I, I think those, you know, I'd like to be able to have time for that. Well, I think, I think a great place to start is a question from Gregory Robinson. Um, uh, for both of you, uh, he says, when starting your company, what did your team look like to achieve success in the industry? And who was or would be the first person you would or should hire outside of yourself? That's a good question. Um, so this, You're looking at the starting this team. was and still is the team. <laughs> um, we, you know, we brought on our first um, studio assistant like two years before the pandemic. Um, but that was year seven into the company, you know, she went on to other places and then because of the pandemic, we didn't bring on anyone else. So we're back to just us again, but who was the first person you should hire? It, it's, I don't know. I think it also depends. It really depends on what your team looks like and what your relationships look like. We did as much internally as possible from the very beginning and we would not hire anyone until we tried it ourselves. Um, like we know what the sale, what it looked like to have sales conversations, like what the rate of response were. The same with press. Um, you to hire someone, you need to be realistic on what your expectations can be of them, and so you need to try it yourself to be aware. Also, like what kind of person you need to fill those voids. Um, Maybe the first person. Uh, it was more freelance, but probably a pattern maker. I did the patterns the first two um, seasons that we started. And I really enjoyed it, but like doing all the corrections and doing production patterns, it was just like, it was not like I was going to go crazy. So, um, you know, you kind of learn where your limits are and when to bring someone on. Also start, my biggest advice would be start small and understand what your brand is about. You don't need 20 looks. You don't need 400 pieces. What are like, you should be able to understand your brand in five looks. Yeah, we, I think we started with 11 dresses. Yeah. And it didn't really grow from that for a few years. It was just like, maybe we got to 20 after like the second. And we're even back down to a point now that we realize what you don't need. Like we, yeah. we would rather have 90% of the collection ready to like be produced and tell the story versus just have pieces to have, fill a rack. Yeah, I think you have to look at your business, see where it is and be realistic. Sort of a follow-up to that question comes from Nzinga Helwig who asks, um, what are the sum what are some of the most important attributes you look for in potential additions to your team? Well, I think whenever you're working with someone, it's someone who can en enhance and kind of contribute and make things even better. So I, we, you know, we're always looking for someone who's like the best at what they do, because that only enhances what we're doing and only enhances what they're doing. So I think if that, I mean, I feel like that's a very like loopy answer, but, <laughs> but that's kind of what, what I'm always looking for. And also like kind of look at the void that we're trying to fill at the time. Also tech packs are always, yeah. always a thing that if someone has on their resume is beneficial yeah. for us. Yeah. Cause that's right now what we really need. And that's what a lot of companies need right now. And I know a lot of the students I've been talking to, I've been emailing every student about their portfolios be like, where are the tech packs? Because that's right now, especially that you're not really going into factories, it's it's going to be all about the tech packs. And that's going to be something that's going to be very important to whoever's hiring you. So um, Chloe Hawkins, uh, you touched on this a little bit, but um, she asks, how has your brand's social media strategy shifted over the course of the pandemic? I think it's told a true story of where we are and what we're doing and who we are as people. Um, we don't like to force our opinion on anybody and we also don't like to force an idea. We we use social media in the early time of COVID and quarantine to kind of tell the story and it, Jonathan documented flowers he saw and just like beautiful things that came. If it meant fabric remnants and what we could create with it, if it meant drawing on things. Um, I think our biggest voice was in our social stance towards different organizations we got behind, but we also feel it's for someone else to kind of discover and we allowed the beauty of the flowers to tell that story. Yeah, I think also what's amazing, I have like a love-hate relationship with social media, um, but I think one thing that I really do 
love about it and what I tell like young people starting their brand, which is really incredible is that when we started the company, there was no Instagram. I think Twitter had come out, but I like really, I still to this day, like hate Twitter. <laughs> and um, what I keep saying is that before that you kind of, you'd have your story and you'd pitch it to these magazines and see who would bite. And you'd have to kind of wait for like a magazine to tell your story. But what's amazing about social media is that you can really communicate your story be before and really get it out there without having to wait. And I think there's something really empowering about that. So a couple of people are asking about internships. Do you take on interns? We, we do. do. We it's currently are doing digital internships with students that allow them to be stay in place. We're not at a point that we feel safe kind of sending students out into the factories or different appointments, but we have built an unbelievable internship program doing things digitally and via Zoom. Yeah, we, we really tried to still make that a good experience for the interns, even through digital experience. You know, we have touch bases and we all get on the, the computer to like talk and even just to check in and you know, um, you know, but it, it's definitely, it's, it's different, you know, because we're used to like the intern will be there and they just get to see everything. And then, you know, you, you don't get to do that as much, but we'll like try to zoom them in into fittings and, you know, show them what's going on. And yeah, it's a lot of digital work. I will say that. Okay, great. Um, and David Longshaw um, has this question. If you were a student today, is there any advice that you would give yourself? Long time no see, David. <laughs> good to see you. Um, Hi. Good, good to, to see you. Too. It's been years. It's been uh, ages. We met in Paris, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Susan. 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 It was in a Berlin game. Yes. Yeah, I remember that very well. Um, if I was a student now, go out more. <laughs> <laughs> Go see the world a little more. Like, don't be scared to like take a break. Um, I mean, I had a lot of fun, but um, yeah, that is actually something that I think is really important. I mean, I know right now we can't do it, but like, I was, we were both very serious students, and we interned every summer. And, you know, I, I do, you know, I think it is important to like live and go see things and um, experience, you know, young adulthood in New York because um, it is so incredible. Um, but I think. I don't know, like have fun and like just really enjoy it and just realize like it's a four years to really incubate your ideas, you know, where you might not get that again so easily where no one's going to bother you about it. And you could just get to like really marinate on them and really learn about who you are as a designer and as a person. Also your relationships you form yeah. from internships to your professors, to other students in your class. I mean, we have an ongoing collaboration with someone who is in school with us now who has her own brand. Um, you know, one of my favorite parts about, of college were my professors who were in the world and at 6 p.m. they would come and teach a class and I still have, ex I have amazing relationships with them. Like one of them sponsored a component of our show. Um, it's just building your relationships and keeping in touch and making sure when you do leave school, they know what you're doing. Yeah. And also I think interning has been, was very important to us because um, one thing's to like be working on stuff in school, but you can get very like narrow-minded. And then when you kind of go out into your internship and you see what's happening in, in real time in the real world in the industry, it's a very different thing. You know, like I, I would spend, I, and, this isn't, I, I don't know what's going on if SCAD does this, I don't think they do, but you know, we were spending hours like washing these figures, you know, and then you get into the real world and they're like, you don't have time to wash and like color in the figures, like just use a marker. <laughs> so it's like, you start to learn like, oh, like I, I can't take this long on like washing a garment. So it was like this, I learned that very quickly in my freshman year and I still worked really hard on my school project washing, but also made sure I learned how to like quickly um, render a sketch. So that's like a very small example, but that was like something I, I wouldn't have necessarily known until I got out into the real world, as like funny as that sounds. That's great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. And Cecilia asks, um, if you could talk to us a little bit more about your, your design process, what does that look like? And how do you stay true to your brand? Um, 
So the design process, it, it kind of varies. You know, I have a very cinematic mind in the sense like I grew up around a lot of film and movies and it was something I really always enjoyed and I loved music and going to concerts. So I, I very much always like feel like I'm a storyteller. And so it starts usually with like a concept and a story in my head and I kind of storyboarded it out as if like, you know, I was a director or something. And they're not very like, um, director worthy like storyboards, but they're very important to me that I kind of understand the story that we're trying to tell. So that's the first thing I do. And then it always starts with the textiles because we are such a textile heavy brand. And then it goes into the shapes that will go with those textiles and the type of fabrics we're gonna um, print them on. And that's kind of the one kind of amazing thing about being a textile brand is that I can kind of inform the silhouette versus like after, you know, if that makes sense, because we can print it on anything, you know, so if I want a more structured look, we just print it on a more structured fabric versus like the opposite way around. Versus having to work fabrics into those styles. Yeah. We also explore that way. If we found a new opportunity or a new way to do a textile, we're like, how can we build a part of the collection off of this? But it's a, and I think a mood board is always very important to me. And usually like that's the first thing I'll give an intern to do is because that mood board I always say has to like inspire you for the next however um, many months you're working on the collection. So you should be able to look at it from the beginning to end and like it's still like invigorate you. And we try like not to have any clothing on the mood board like so that it comes from a very pure place. Um, that's something that like we don't look at like vintage pieces and not saying that like what we do is like you know never been seen it but we don't kind of inform ourselves from other people's clothing thank you and um gabriel gutierrez asks in regards to the uh jump start of our flower shop would this have been something possibly created even without the presence of covid or was this something created solely out of response to the global issue? Um, it's hard to say. I, you know, for me, what happened was, I, I remember this very vividly, I was staying, I had gone home at March and stayed there for a few months during quarantine. And I remember it was my mom's birthday and she got flowers delivered and we were like spraying it with Lysol. I'm like, that's so sad. We can't even like get flower deliveries. It like scares us. And then I, you know, Sarah and I are always like, we always send flowers to say thank you to people. And we were just, we saw that everyone was super like sad and upset. So I started drawing these bouquets and just sending them just out of like to connect with people. And then I was on a walk one day and I called Sarah and I was like, hey, I think we should like do this. We should put this on our website. And she was like, I actually was thinking the same exact thing. And like, I think it would be great. And it was like within five days, we put it on our website and we just like went with it. Yeah, beforehand, we wouldn't have time within five days to launch a whole new component of our website. Yeah. Um, also, the fact- also, I feel like we would have like maybe not thought about it a little more, but not reacted so quickly. Right. I think we would have been like finding different ways to have more of a tech, like a component that you could tactile. I think it was just the time and place and there will always be a place for it. Um, we saw in the beginning, obviously, you no one was ordering flowers to be delivered because of the Lysol component and the safety and FedEx. So it was- the right time and place. And I think just, it allowed us to create an inventory list product and there was no fear or hesitation because we can constantly create things, launch things and not worry if we had to produce them, if they had, how they would, people would react and how to get them to people. Yeah, but I think to go back to your question, I think it's more than what I love about fashion and the industry as it's like, it's pros and cons of like how quickly it moves. It's like, you really have to adapt and figure um, like this is where things are moving. So like, this is where we have to go or else, you know, you get left behind or like, you know, so, and I think that's a great thing as a creative to constantly push yourself to think of new ways to um, kind of adapt to the moment and like meet the moment. So I think if it wasn't our flower shop during COVID, I, I feel like it would have come out in another way, but um, yeah, I think it's just about being open. Thanks. I think that's a great, that's a great um, words of advice there at the end. Just, you know, being creative is, is being adaptable and reacting to the environment, you know, into the contemporary world and what's going on. So 
Thanks. Thanks so much for participating in the, the questions for everybody. And um, thanks for your answers, Sarah and Jonathan. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys. It's great. Yeah, thank you all for the question. I think Alex, yeah, we wrap it up. Is that correct? Yeah, that was our last that was our last question. Okay. Great. Very good. Thank so you. So really for all of you, thank you very much for coming. I have here, you know, a little outro that is like again, thank you, Jonathan and Sarah, and thanks to all of you. Please join us later today at 2 p.m. when we have the uh, target design strategist Joel Botkin. And so, please, there will be more to come. You never get bored at SCAT. There is always, yeah. you know, another great story to be told. And, yeah, really, Sarah, John, thank you very, very much. We appreciate everything you do, you know, that you create, that also that you do and help with our students, the mentorship that you give. So, thank you. And, yeah, best of luck and keep us posted what's coming next, what's happening. We're super curious to see what the world is doing, but as well, what your journey further will bring. And I'm sure it will be wonderful. Yes, yeah, so all the success and thanks for coming. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Thank Bye. you. Thanks.